Director of Cities here at MI. And I'm so pleased to introduce this timely and important discussion with Jano Lieber, Chairman of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Just a few days ago, the MTA Board approved a plan to implement congestion pricing for drivers entering Manhattan's Central Business District, a critical step towards making this ambitious yet controversial plan a reality. The vote comes at a time when the MTA is facing many challenges, including mounting debt, still elevated levels of violent crime and deaths in the subway system, micro-mobility forms of transportation, and restoring ridership back to pre-pandemic levels. The MTA is grappling with these challenges while pursuing subway expansions and other capital projects to improve service and entice commuters back to the transit system. To discuss these issues and more, we are delighted and honored to have Chairman Daniel Lieber, a native New Yorker who grew up taking some ways in uh, who will deliver brief remarks. I will then sit down for an interview with Nicole Gelinas, Manhattan Institute Senior Fellow, contributing editor of City Journal, and one of New York City's most insightful and incisive commentators, including on congestion pricing. Mr. Lieber was confirmed as MTA chairman in January 2022, and had previously been MTA's acting chair and CEO since July 2021. Formerly, he was president and MTA of MTA Construction and Development, president of World Trade Center Properties, and held numerous administrative positions under President Bill Clinton and Mayor Ed Koch. Please join me in thanking and warmly welcoming to the stage Chairman Jano Lieber. Always a challenge when you're introduced as, as, as the person responsible for controversial issues. But there is no controversy at the Manhattan Institute for the very fine free breakfast. So I heard it all in the first half. Well, in case you're it's going to go on. Um, I love to, to have the dialogues with um, people across the political spectrum, irrespective of whether we agree on everything, this is one of the organizations that really does dig into data and substance and try to use that to talk about policy. And so for me, it is a treat to be at the Manhattan Institute. Nicole and I have done a version of this um, every year for the last, this is the third year running, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. I've been trying to, to actually to use that kind of analytics to drive what we do. So my friend, um, no clicker, can't click. Um, let me talk to you a little bit quickly about the goals, uh, the specific goals that we set at the start of this year that we're winding down uh, and what we've accomplished. I think it is uh, a, a, an impressive set of accomplishments. Um, first up, winning riders back with better service. This is my top goal. Um, Subway OTP on time performance is the best that it's been in 10 years. Doesn't mean we still aren't pushing forward and we're actually gonna set higher goals for 2024, but that is an important milestone, um, pushing 85%. And the subways are now carrying four, more than 4 million customers regularly on the weekdays. In fact, last week was the best week in total for subway ridership since the beginning of the pandemic. The commuter railroads are in, in the same direction. You've got nine, an average of 95 plus percent on time performance. I think it's 97 percent in Metro North. And we're also well over 70 percent of ridership there, to, you know, north of 200,000 riders down yeah, both Metro North and Long Island Railroad. And you know, not only are we moving people back into mass transit, recovering from the pandemic, supporting the economic recovery of the city coming back to life. But we are hitting our revenue projection. This is important, uh, important for all of us because, I, I, as I will talk about, we struggled with you know, the post-COVID uh, revenue deficits, and making sure that as we move forward, that we're hitting our revenue projection is super important. I'm thrilled about that. And we've done all of this while we are increasing service. For the past year, MTA is operating a new terminal, Grand Central Madison. Uh, our, our folks at least came in on it this morning that a couple of weeks after it was open, it became the fourth busiest passenger railroad facility in the United States. No one wanted to touch this project when I arrived at the MTA because it had that awful track record on budget and schedule, but we stopped the schedule slippage. We said, we said we're not gonna push the data out anymore. We drove the project hard and we got 
Great Central Madison, which is the first passenger railroad, eight track passenger railroad facility in the United States to open since the 1950s, we got it open. And that allowed us to implement the largest service increase on the Long Island Railroad ever. 300 plus trains per day on top of the 650 trains that were already operating. That increase in itself, just the increase, is almost as large as the total number of trains that New Jersey Transit runs into New York City every day. So we're talking about a massive increase in, in service on the Long Island Railroad. And probably most important from a policy point of view, long run, in addition to attracting regular commuters back to the railroad, we've created the opportunity for reverse commuting. Long Island, Long Island economy was kind of isolated because they couldn't hire people from the east. They couldn't get people who lived in the city to come out to the island for jobs. Increasingly, Long Island, like the whole region, is in the knowledge economy business. They need to be able to hire from the full um, regional workforce. Now we have real reverse commuting on the Long Island Railroad, and the numbers of people who are using it have gone up dramatically. And thanks to the, the governor's budget, which I'll talk about more in a moment, we're actually adding subway service on 12 lines. Eight of them have already been done. We're reducing the headways. That's the time between trains, so that's frequency. The frequency is going up by 20 to 25 percent on those lines, and we're seeing people use them more frequently, especially nights and weekends. Um, when decisions about whether to ride are more complicated. Um, promoting public safety. This is obviously uh, a big issue for this group, and it also has been for the governor and the mayor. Since the governor and the mayor lost, launched uh, what they called COPS Cameras in Care, it was about a year ago, um, the overall trend on safety has been positive. We still have a long way to go, but there has been a reduction in crime there has, notwithstanding higher ridership, and there has been uh, significant reduction in crime relative to pre-pandemic days. So uh, don't get me wrong, we are continuing to struggle with high-profile incidents that really uh, scare a lot of people, um, and also with the impact of the mental health population. We're all experiencing it. There are a lot more folks who are struggling with mental health issues in the public space in general. It is especially impactful in closed environment like the subway. Um, and we have to deal with these issues. I've been talking about that for quite some time. But just to put it in perspective, with five to seven incidents per day um, on a subway that carries four million people, which is about the same as the population of the city of LA, I don't think it's fair to portray it as the dystopian environment that we sometimes see uh, in, in for politicians and, and a few folks in the media. Um, and as we continue to work in close partnership with the NYPD, they are actually growing their focus to quality of life issues. This is important for us. It's not only about felony crime, it's about that environment that creates a sense of disorder. And there has been progress on some of the key metrics that we monitor on that track intrusions. These are people getting onto the tracks, whether they're folks who are trying to do themselves harm, which unfortunately is, is um, happens um, more often than we would like. Folks who are just, as I say, struggling with mental health issues, people who are just being disorderly, that has gone down by 28%. The presence of homeless folks on the trains that we monitor and try to work uh, with folks who are sheltering the system. These are the overnight operations that we have at the end of the line stations. The, the average uh, presence of homeless on those trains has gone down at more than 20% in the last year as we continue to operate those end of line uh, outreach operations to try to reach the homeless. Um, and, the, and the NYPD is now using quality of life data to evaluate and guide their borough and district commanders. That was super important to us. The guy who is the head of the transit bureau is a fantastic um, chief, Michael Kemper has been a fantastic partner for, for the MTA. And we work with them very closely every day, all day. And um, this is an area where I'm truly uh, optimistic. Um, we have been getting, you know, there's no, it's no secret that as police budgets have been cut, there's been a reduction in overtime that allows us to have more presence of cops in the system. But we have been getting in the system a much larger, a, 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 a disproportionately positive share of all that overtime. And I'll continue to push for it. I know Chief Kemper works hard on that as well. Now, 
budget. Governor Hochul stepped up for riders in her 2020, uh, 2023 state budget, which allowed us to project a balanced MTA budget for the next five years. I, you know, this was a huge issue for us, talking about what we did in, 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 in the past year. Um, we started talking about what the MTA is facing. This is a national problem. The reduction in ridership has had huge financial implications for every transit system. Only the MTA of the big transit systems has found its way to a more optimistic place, a, 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 a more uh, settled long-term budget situation. What we did was, we did it the old-fashioned way. We went out and made the case for, for transit investment. We said, and talked about how essential transit investment is, how it makes New York possible, and all the other benefits that we all see from transit, economically, socially, and otherwise. We engage with stakeholders and electors. We use the press to, to try to uh, to try to raise consciousness on this issue. And so when the issue came to the public, it got broad support because I think we had laid the groundwork effectively. The kicker was that the New York business community, the big business community said, you know, you're right. We want five day a week great service, even though we're only having people come to the office one to three days a week. So we're willing to pay a little more in the payroll mobility tax. How often does that happen? One, credit to the business community, led by the New York City Partnership for, for being visionary. Um, but two, I think that building consensus here was, in, in some ways, it became a much less controversial story. We were able to get that through the state budget without fighting about it too much because we had laid the groundwork. So I'm gonna take the credit, especially the MTA team that worked on raising consciousness about that. Not to be forgotten, the MTA did some of the heavy lifting ourselves. We committed from the outset to, to cut uh, $400 million from our budget um, just through efficiency, not by layoffs, not by reducing service. And we've actually raised that goal. We've hit it for uh, 2023, 2024 now. Obviously, I have to monitor implementation, but we, we've raised the goal to $500 million for 2025 and beyond. So we're serious about, serious about becoming more efficient ourselves as well. Did you lose the video? Um, so, um, I was going to show you a really great graphic, um, but the, the, other is, the other point that I, I, I really want to call your attention to is that despite all the major service increase and with the, uh, the addition of a little extra payroll mobility tax to fill that gap in the budget, the real inflation adjusted budget of the MTA has actually gone down by 500 million in the past five years. Gone down, that's 3% of our budget. How many other organizations of our scale in government are actually reducing their budget in real terms? Um, we have a long way to go, but contrary to the prattle you sometimes hear from politicians from New Jersey who should go unnamed, um, the MTA I think is, I, I, I'm, I'm it's way too early to crow about how everything is perfect. It's not absolutely not. But I think among organizations, government organizations are a scale, we are among the better managed ones and we're gonna keep pushing forward to save money on all kinds of stuff that it seems to me to be incredibly wasteful. Like how the workers' constant system leaves money out of public institutions and how the tort system um, costs the NTA several hundred million dollars a year. We have to get better about managing those areas um, uh, notwithstanding the politics, but I think the MTA is on the right track. There is one major risk that we cannot overlook, a risk to our, our financial outlook, and that's the growing problem of fare evasion. While overall fare revenues are currently tracking MTA forecasts, as I said, we're on the, on the trajectory that we projected, the number of paying riders has significantly dropped. And it's especially true on the bus. This is something I've been talking about for a long time. I would have shown you a bunch of tweets from the media when I made a speech about this in the spring of 2022. There was a lot of eye rolling when I made that speech. You know, why are you making such a big issue of fare evasion? Um, I have always felt that this is not only an economic issue, but it's fundamental to you know, our sense of community in New York, that it's demoralizing when you're in an environment where it feels like people are just making up their own rules. Even small infractions in a closed environment give a sense of the place is not 
this is not a rule compliant environment. You don't know what the other guy is going to do. And it's really tears at social fabric when you actually pay or tap and the guy next to you sees the gate open and veers over there, even if he has his Metro card in his hand. And we all see it all the time. Now, um, we have been significantly increasing the number of fair evasion summonses that the NYPD is giving out. But truthfully, we don't have enough cops to cover every entrance and every bus. And the problem on the buses has become especially acute, but, but um, we, we not only need to do more enforcement, which I think I very much support, but we also need to grow the sense uh, that everybody um, is in this together so that we have more voluntary compliance. So we are pursuing a program where we're gonna harden the, uh, the entryways, hopefully have better turnstiles that deter fair evasion, higher turnstiles so people can't display their athletic prowess by vaulting over them. Um, uh, and actually dealing with that exit gate, which I hate, it is required by the fire code authorities now, it's an exiting path, but we have to figure out how to have a turnstile that will satisfy the, 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 the fire safety professionals but which doesn't just invite people to open the door. In many cases, to run scams where they they break the machine and they start collecting from people as they walk in. We have to deal with the physical infrastructure, but we also have to persuade New Yorkers. Again, that this is part of being a New Yorker. I know it sounds a little far fetched, but um, I believe that that is uh, that sense of community is something we have to hold on to and fight for. Now. Next slide. Congestion pricing. <laughs> it's a picture of congestion in New York with cars backed up, you can imagine. Um, another major priority is getting congestion pricing on the finish line so we can finally do something about the insane traffic that is choking our city. Whatever your political outlook and wherever you live, you got to know, and this is a policy, substantive policy organization. We have a, a situation that needs to be addressed. You cannot just pretend that congestion is not an issue when we have fire trucks you know, unable to get to fires and ambulances can't get to hospitals. It all is documented in the mayor's management report. Buses can't get, can't do what they're supposed to do. And frankly, people who have to drive, whether they're trucks or even individuals who have tools or uh, otherwise are required to drive, are wasting a ton of time. In now, I just want to remind you, the idea of pricing public uh, public goods to try to you know, eliminate the irrationality is a conservative idea. So I'm gonna pitch that to the, Ma the Manhattan Institute. Remember that this came out of the conservative movement and not to be forgotten, we do need the money. The $15 billion that congestion pricing is gonna uh, generate is 30% of our capital program. And it's gonna help us to strengthen and expand the MTA network. So for all those reasons, I think this is an incredibly responsible policy, obviously controversial, but we have to forge ahead. Um, we're approaching the end of what I call the adventure and bureaucracy that congestion pricing has asked us to uh, execute on. Um, we're, we've, we've done the federal environmental process that's a couple of years, and now we're in the middle of uh, complying with the terms of the 2019 New York State law establish the congestion pricing program. So we have to have another round of, of public outreach and public comment and respond to all of that. But last week, the MTA board voted to start that public review process as required by state law. Those hearings are gonna take place in the new year and then the board will review the input and hopefully, hopefully vote again to authorize us to implement the program. Our goal was to start collecting tolls in the late spring. You may be aware that the infrastructure, all the cameras and the infrastructure has been mostly installed. We're in the process of getting it all hooked up and functional electrically and otherwise, uh, but it's, it's almost all there. Um, so progress, unless we're slowed down by our neighbors in New Jersey who are doing their best or their worst, to stop us. But please bear in mind, there is a reason that the business community, New York City Partnership, Real Estate Board and all the major business organizations were early supporters of congestion pricing. And there's a reason why people care also about the environment and street safety and equity um, have been supporters of it as well. 
Have we given up on this entirely? We're still broadcasting, and the slides are going out to the stream. Oh. But I think you have to proceed. Right, so I'm, I'm on to the one that says capital program. That's right. Um, so they're there. Um, congestion pricing is going to have a huge benefit, as I said, to the capital program and funding essential projects that can help to bring us. As I, I always say, I, I want the MTA to, to, uh, to be brought into the late 20th century, but I think that we we are shooting for the 21st century with a lot of the capital program. Um, and we're pretty far underway with that. Cap Remember, we have a $52 billion five-year capital program 2020 to 2024. We lost about 18 months because during COVID, when we didn't know how much money was coming from Washington, we had to husband our resources to make sure we weren't have to use capital just to keep the lights on and the trains running. Um, but we have been knocking out projects at about $10 billion a year, which is the right pace. And we're doing them more efficiently than ever before. Next slide. You may have read about how we're building new ADA station. This is where the visual, the absence of the visuals is going to be completely, uh, it's going to confuse all of us. We're building ADA stations five times as fast as in the past, 67 stations in development and eight ADA openings this year with a couple more to come. Next. We finished may mega projects like Grand Central Madison. Imagine a beautiful picture of Grand Central Madison. That's huge uh, escalators. I'll provide verbal descriptions. Um, next, uh, we also finished double track and third track on Long Island. Grand Central Madison, formerly known as Eastside Access, was a project begun in the PAC administration. I already remember Al D'Amato. This was Al D'Amato, you know, got it because he had the power to make the United States Congress in those days uh, give a ton of money uh, to a Long Island driven project. The projects that we, this team has gotten to start, design and procure and finish, double track and third track on Long Island were finished on time and under budget. Let me repeat that again, on time and under budget. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm sort of worn out on accounting for the mistakes of 2007, 2008 on Eastside Access. We finished that project. It was a mess. We cleaned it up. We got it done. But this team is delivering projects on time and under budget. And the L train project, where the world thought we were going to have to close the L train for a couple of years, and they made plans that everybody was going to, you know, they were going to have, you know, uh, you know, watercraft. They were bringing people over from Williamsburg. There were going to be Jetsons, uh, backpacks to fly you over. I mean, there every different idea about how people would get to Manhattan to work. And instead, we kept the L train going. We finished the project. We redid the, the L train tunnel, which had been savaged by Sandy. Fixed all the uh, all the infrastructure that was in it. Got all the pumping infrastructure out of harm's way. Smart idea to dump the pumping infrastructure down where the water can knock it out. Um, and we did it on time and under budget. So that's a little bit a point of pride for for my team. Next slide. We also got the Elmont UBS uh, station, the Long Island Road's first new station done 50 years on time and on budget. And then next slide, we did the brand new LIR concourse at Penn Station. If you've been to Penn Station, it is 25% this brand new first class mass transportation facility. It feels like an airport. And then 75% the dump that the 1960s has received to us. But the, the fact that we were able to get that much wider concourse, much higher ceiling in the main east-west corridor has really altered Penn Station. And again, we have gotten successful at next slide. And we broke ground on another mega project, which is really close to my heart. It's called Metro North Penn Station Access. What it's doing is if you go to, to New Haven or Boston on Amtrak, you go out to Penn Station to Queens, and then you fly over the Hellgate Bridge, you know, that, that arch bridge you see you're driving out to LaGuardia, um, and you fly through the Bronx, no one stops in the Bronx, and it goes on to New Haven and Bridgeport and, and Boston and so on. Um, we're turning that two-track railroad into a four-track railroad, we're doing all the infrastructure and making it possible for that to carry Metro North commuter service. So people who live in Co-op City, there are 55,000 of them, they have crappy mass transit, they mostly rely on on so-called express buses that take, you know, because of traffic and other things, like 75 minutes for them to get to a job in Manhattan. And, and you can't easily, by mass transit, get go north 
to get a job in Westchester, Connecticut, which for many of those people would be convenient and um, really desirable. So we're providing mass transit to neighborhoods that don't have it, that really deserve it. And that's a, four new stations in the Bronx and a whole new railroad using, this is what I love, using existing infrastructure, getting more out of existing infrastructure. That's a theme uh, of a lot of what we're doing. Next slide. We're also modernizing signals across the system. This is how you grow your capacity to provide more service. Modern signaling will, will let you run more trains safely close together. Our current system, much of which dates from the Roosevelt administration, doesn't let you. Uh, you have to keep trains much further apart because you don't actually know exactly where they are. Next. And we're making $600 million worth of investment in the Park Avenue Viaduct. When you come out of, uh, when the Metro North trains come out at 97th Street, come out of the tunnel, they go onto that viaduct, which is more than 100 years old. It, it ain't in great shape. And it is literally 98% of the whole Metro North system is dependent on that network, but also on the tunnel and on the Grand Central train show. We investment in taking that up. Um, next. And the vast majority of our work is actually state of good repair. We talk about, this is a, a term of art in, in the industry that, that sometimes uh, isn't understood. What we're trying to do is to, to bring it into condition where it can function as it is supposed to function to deliver the level of service. Uh, so it's basic stuff like track replacement, power station, structural repairs, all that concrete that's 100 years old wants to fall apart, you got to invest in it. Um, and now we're next, um, we're moving ahead to the next generation of improvements in the capital program, which will be guided by a document we put out a couple weeks ago, uh, in statutorily required so-called 20-year needs assessment. It's the first time the MTA ever undertook something of this scale. We looked at 6 million components and assets to determine what was their condition and their, um, and their vulnerabilities. Um, the 20-year the, the needs assessment that we put out makes the prior versions, frankly, look like kids' coloring books. It is a very substantial document, and we're using it to make the chart a course for the next capital program, which is going to be uh, up to the legislature and the governor at the end of 2024 and then into the 2025 uh, legislative session. Next, it won't come cheap, but the need is real. Basic business principles, which I know that there are a lot of folks here understand. Basic principles say that when you have a $1.5 trillion asset, which is what we have, we have an asset worth a trillion and a half dollars, it's old, it wants to fall apart, and you have to make investment if you want it to continue to function. Um, and that's what this report is documenting. So I'm going to wind down um, now that I told you that uh, told the Manhattan Institute that after we got our budget balance, we want even more money. Uh, a great idea. But um, honestly, this is, this, you know, I always say that for New Yorkers, mass transit is like air and water. We need it to survive. It is what makes New York possible. And we have to keep investing in it if we're serious about having a city that is as livable and as dynamic as we want it. So with that, we apologize for the light. Turn it over to Nicole. Thanks for being with us today. I guess my, my burning question is to the signal stage from the Theodore Roosevelt administration or the FDR. <laughs> you know, it, it, I'm, I'm not surprised. It is the, it's the Franklin Roosevelt administration. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Yeah, you literally um, in the signaling area um, on Sixth Avenue line with so it's the, you know, B T the F. Um, there is a whole major network that date from the Franklin Roosevelt era, and it's the major choke point both in Manhattan where all the trains come together, but also on the A train we have you know a huge choke point you know in sort of close in Brooklyn we call J Street interlocking. And that project, we just had to delay because the New Jersey lawsuit means that congestion pricing right now isn't certain enough for me to award a contract based on it. So this is important stuff. So congestion pricing, we're the closest that we've ever been since we started talking about it half a century ago. Is the New Jersey lawsuit the only remaining impediments? And can you update us on what is the status of the litigation? And what is well, the, your status, the status of litigation is 
I mean, I'm I'm a mostly reformed lawyer, so forgive me if I talk like one. Um, the, the the New Jersey uh, federal courts had a pretty aggressive schedule, which is designed to resolve this before congestion pricing was supposed to turn on in like May. Um, so the two sides are filing, you know, most cross motions for summary judgment. Each side getting to put in papers and say, you should, you judge should decide in our favor. So they put theirs in, ours are going in pretty soon, I think in the next week or two, and um, it will be, you know, it, there'll be major action on it sometime in the spring before uh, we, you know, we were scheduled to begin congestion pricing. It is a major impediment, you know, I, I think, I would say that our position is, you know, we complied with everything. We did a 4,000 page environmental analysis that was specifically directed by the federal government. We answered 70,000 comments or submissions from the public. Um, we all held, you know, 25 hearings and outreach events. A lot of them involved folks in New Jersey, not just people in New Jersey, but New Jersey government entities were invited to participate. And and the federal law does not dictate a particular outcome. It says you have to have an inclusive process and really sort of surface information so that the decision can be looked at, um, see whether it's based on facts and evidence. And we did that, so I'm optimistic. And should the lawsuit be resolved, do you have the governor's support to turn it on in May? Yes. I mean, you, you, you've seen Kathy Hochul has just been uh, really strong in congestion pricing and most recently last week, she, uh, she gave a rousing uh, address at, uh, at a rally just before. So one of the issues that came out during the environmental review process was the risk that congestion pricing would send more heavy trucks to the Bronx, uh, anywhere from 50 to 700 more <coughs> trucks on the Cross Bronx Express Expressway, for example, in truck drivers going around Manhattan instead of through Manhattan to avoid the, the new toll. How is the MTA, first of all, do you agree that that's a real risk? And if so, how will the MTA mitigate that risk so as not to give the Bronx an even bigger pollution, congestion, noise, and pedestrian burden? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, you really have to look at it in percentage terms. Like, first of all, what the, the environmental review found was that there were no violations of air quality at all caused as a result of the National Air Quality Service. That the, the, the overall impact on air quality of the region is very positive. There are any time that you mess with traffic in any way, you know, that's why we had to study intersections all the way to Philadelphia. Um, it has consequences and impacts through the system. And um, so we have identified those using these elaborate models that uh, traffic and air quality that, that are dictated by federal law. And we identified those. And we actually sat down with the environmental justice folks in the Bronx and with Richie Torres, who's a, uh, I mean, in my experience, pretty thoughtful uh, congressional member who's very passionate about this issue. He opened a package of so called mitigations. Um, one of the major ones, without going through everything, uh, is that we're going to convert more than 100 of these diesel-powered refrigeration units at the Hunts Point market to uh, clean fuel. And just that one investment offsets the impact of a couple hundred more trucks on the cross box because those dirty uh, refrigeration units, diesel-powered refrigeration units, have such a negative effect on the South Bronx. So we found a way to deal with it. Um, and it was acceptable to the, that community. And, but we haven't ruled out additional targeted mitigations. Once we've finalized what the plan is and we've analyzed it through these computer models that take weeks to run, we haven't ruled it out. So we said in our, in our legal briefs, that we are prepared to do some of these investments in, in targeted ways in New Jersey as well. It's just that it's premature to say exactly where, um, but we've accounted for that in the plan. So that could potentially be a deal with New Jersey to head off this litigation, uh, possibly some portion of these revenues going to mitigation in New Jersey. I mean, it's probably inappropriate for me to get into, uh, you know, a settlement scenario. But in principle, 
we've said to them and to everybody, we are planning to make some targeted investments in New Jersey communities where there are really small impacts in terms of traffic. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of congestion pricing, the mayor of New York has been an inconsistent supporter. Last week, he asked for two exemptions. One of them is contrary to what your own panel recommended in no extra charge on yellow cabs. He also wants a bigger exemption from for school buses than your panel recommended. Uh, how do you expect to resolve what the mayor wants and more broadly, what does the MTA need from the city of New York, which controls the streets of New York to make sure that congestion pricing works? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good point. Look, I, I think on the, the two issues that the mayor raised, one of them I think we're pretty closely aligned, uh, which is we do want to exempt school buses. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have not yet figured out the, the, the mechanics of how to distinguish in school buses, are, which are privately owned overwhelmingly are carrying pupils to and from school versus functioning as party buses or doing some other private sector type work. So we're we're working on that. So I think we're aligned on that one. With, with taxi issue, I think we're aligned in our goal. We do not, you know, we, uh, the, the panel proposed that it was, that the, uh, the surcharge on taxi rides was half what it would be for Ubers and Lyfts and for our vehicles. So um, we're definitely trying to be mindful of the fact that taxi industry has struggled and that they are dependent on, uh, on uh, you know, hails that are in the district. So um, our, our analysis showed that that would only be a three or 4% increase in the price of a taxi ride and that they might, and, and that they wouldn't be getting less rides as a result. Um, and that they will have, you know, if, if traffic gets better, they can make more money. So we think it's a, it should be a net win for the taxi industry, um, but we're optimistic. That'll, that'll okay. And one element of getting congestion pricing to work as intended is making people even more comfortable <coughs> getting on the trains and buses, yes. including late at night after they've seen a show or gone out to dinner. So uh, on that issue of uh, the crime and public safety aspect, uh, first we can start with the traditional broken windows theory of policing. If we want to cut violent crime, we have to start with the smaller crimes, including the fair meeting that you brought up. Uh, you talked about how police summonses are back up. They're actually exceeding 2019 levels. So the police are certainly back in the system. They're being assertive and interacting with people allegedly breaking the law in the system. But the big difference is that more and more of these summonses are civil summons. They are not the misdemeanor summons where after you've wrapped up a few summonses, then you can be uh, arrested and detained. The civil summons, the problem is you can just not pay them and there's effectively no penalty. Do you see that as an issue that's impeding the enforcement of the fair laws that people are just ignoring these civil summonses? Do you need more from the DAs or the mayor or the state the legislature on it? I mean, I would refer back to what was in, you know, I, I did this uh, Blue Ribbon Commission that we uh, handled in back in the spring of 22. And one of their recommendations is that recidivists actually receive different treatment than folks who uh, may be, you know, racking up their first or second fair evasion offense. So, um, without being, you know, overly prescriptive, I do want to see different treatment for folks who are chronic therapists. I also, one thing that the panel talked about that I thought was especially important is people who are enablers of therapists. So those are the people who are holding the gate open, breaking the machine, um, otherwise kind of encouraging therapists as a routine practice, not just, you know, taking it for themselves, but by others as well. <coughs> So I think that's a big piece of what we have to get our... And those fair evasion neighbors... <laughs> there's a small cold working, and I apologize. That sometimes becomes a violent crime, where just a few weeks ago we saw interaction <coughs> between someone yeah. uh, evading the fair, uh, wanting people to pay him to go into the uh, <coughs> that, That's and a big problem. 
Right, and it turns violent. People uh, were resisting paying this person. He chased after one of them that allegedly uh, assaulted him. So, <coughs> an example of how fair beating, if not enforced, can ex escalate. To that, that's what we want to. We want to come yeah. down on those folks hard. I also just don't want to uh, overlook the fact that fair evasion enforcement is part of keeping the subway safer from bad guys in general because. You know, you do get every week, we get a couple guns just by fair evasion enforcement or by over the weekend, a cop went up to somebody who was smoking pot on, you know, on, on the platform and challenged them and, and did a, a, a search and they had outstanding warrants and recovered a gun. So you know, this sort of quality of life enforcement, I, I hesitate to call it broken windows policing because I don't think there's a theory. Um, I think it's just the reality of, if you control the, the entrance, uh, you will have a more orderly environment inside the system. And that's what we're all shooting for. One of your highest rates of fare evasion is on the select bus service, where you're supposed to pay before you get on the bus. Yeah. Any movement to all door uh, payment on the bus, on the select bus line, so that people don't have that excuse that they, the bus came before they could get their ticket on the curbside uh, machine. You know, listen, you know, I, I, I honestly, I think that we, we are, the MTA collectively were partly to blame for some of the increase in bus fare evasion by confusing riders mm -hmm. with these multiple ways of payment. So somebody gets on second Avenue and they're waiting for the bus, you know, if the regular downtown, uh, uh, bus comes, they might take that or they might take the SBS. So they don't always make the decision beforehand. So people are getting on buses, they're confused, they're a little confused by the, you know, the prepayment feature of SBS. So the, uh, the, the best way to deal with this is to get quickly to Omni so that everybody can pay right there and, and they don't have to have this separate uh, fair payment system that is, is creating confusion and kind of incur I think encouraging fare evasion. A little bit unintentionally, so um, I'm, I'm. I don't think rear door boarding is the issue. I want to get to the point where we have more confidence in our fair bit, you know, our fair enforcement system on buses that we would be able to open the back door and say to everybody, "Get on, it's legal." A lot of people do it now improperly. Um, that's something that's going to take some time. We don't have a history of enforcing the fair on buses. And right now, that's the area where we are seeing massive increases in fare vision. We're gonna to have to come up with new strategies. Starting <coughs> a couple months ago, we now have uh, unarmed, but MTA revenue enforcement agents who are uniformed but unarmed, a couple of plain clothes too, who get on buses and uh, and monitor for fare vision. And we do now, I don't know, like 5,000 summonses just in that short period of time. So. Bus fare evasion is a priority. Fare evasion on subways is about we're between ten and fifteen percent. On buses, it's north of forty. It's really, it's really gotten out of control, and it's a threat to you know that fairness in the whole system. Another aspect of public safety that has grown in the city in the past couple of years is the e-bikes, and particularly the e-bike battery fires, which mm -hmm. have killed eighteen people, mostly in their homes, over the past year alone. The MTA allows people to transport their <coughs> bikes on the trains. Uh, is that something the public should be concerned about and having an e-bike in the <coughs> Most of e-bike fires train. happen when people are are uh, charging. Yeah, and they're not allowed to charge them on the MTA. They're not allowed to charge on the MTA, and frankly, there aren't facilities for charging on the subways. Um, and there's a clear uh, no charging policy on the railroads. So I'm I'm optimistic that we can keep a safe environment. But having all like I, you know, the issues that we're all having with the with the proliferation of e-bikes and so on have to do with the way that they're functioning as like, do they observe traffic rules? Do they not? Are they a regulated part of our transportation system with license plates and helmets, or are they not? Those are real issues that I think that folks are, are trying to get their heads around. From my standpoint, I want it to be safe, which means no charging. But I also want to encourage the you know bringing e-bikes, preferably not full-on motorcycles, 
on our system because you know the last mile connection, whether you're getting off the subway and you live a little ways away from a uh, from the subway or commuter rail station or the four commuters uh, or Long Island Railroad Metro North commuters, that last mile connection is important, and I want to encourage those folks to uh, to use the, our mass trains. Mm -hmm. One of the critical uh, elements in your achieving your capital projects, some of them to be funded through $15 billion in congestion pricing revenue, is project costs. The NYU Marin Institute Transit Project Cost Project estimates that the MCA pays up to 10 times more per mile to build a new subway line, uh, 10 times more than Sweden, 10 times more than Italy. Do you agree with those assessments? And what can the MTA do in general to try to control the cost of its major capital construction projects? You know, I, regretfully, I, I, the MTA is an expensive builder. New York is expensive. Um, our labor costs are expensive. Other complexity of working in this dense environment, the unmapped underground utilities, there are a lot of variables. Um, we have to make it cheap. That was the first thing I, I did when I came to the MTN. I was running the construction and development shop. Was to say we got to change our contracts to stop irrationally allocating risk to a contractor so they just charge you a premium. I won't get into that. We have to de like do less customization so you can more use more conventional components. You have to shrink scope. That's one of the things that the Marin Institute you know invades about is you know contending that the MTA stations are too bad. You know, they're not wrong that stations are where the, the MTA projects, subway projects, like the Second Avenue sub extension, add cost. Um, but they are wrong about how they compare us. Um, they, you know, the, the cost per mile is misleading because our, you know, a lot of our investment in what we have to do in a subway project is is dictated by how many passengers you have getting on and off a particular train. So we talked before about the exiting gate and, and fire safety. Well, under fire safety codes, you have to be able to egress everybody who's on a train, in fact, two trains, because it assumes scenarios where both trains are in the station, one is on fire and everybody has to leave at once. So you need a lot more vertical circulation, elevators, escalators, stairways, and so on. You also need a lot more ventilation capacity and because we operate 24 7 we need to duplicate a lot of our mechanical systems to make sure we can test and repair without turning off the subway so i don't like to debate this stuff with my objection to the marin institute is they compare us to light rail projects that carry 50 people or 100 people per train when we're carrying a thousand people which dictates a lot of the scale of our investment We've tried to work with them, honestly. They're all good people, but these are not, they're not construction engineers, but it's mostly planners and economists. And so when you're just, uh, you know, kind of crowdsourcing uh, cost data, not knowing whether there's real estate cost in it, internal project, internal staffing cost, you don't know what's in the cost that they frequently crowdsource, it's not usually a great, uh, the best benchmark. What we're doing is attacking costs by doing the things I talked about, decustomizing, shrinking scope, and figuring out how to deliver projects using design build especially um, mechanisms more efficiently. I think we're making progress. I won't you know, belabor it, but you know, the Second Avenue subway project through the design has already knocked a billion dollars out of cost just by taking some of those principles and applying them to how the project's being designed. I'll ask two more questions before we go to the audience for Q&A. On your own internal labor cuts, the NTA just signed a labor agreement with its largest union earlier this year. The issue is not the raises, which are similar to the raises that the city government gave its own workforces, but there were no concessions uh, given back by the union in terms of more uh, work done per hour of work. Would you hope that that is different in the next round of contracts in another two and a half years? What kind of productivity savings would you like to see? So we operate, I mean, listen, the real, in the real world, we operate in a, a, a 
kind of bargaining environment where we don't have the leverage. The process doesn't give us the leverage to demand work rule changes um, in quite the way that you and I might like. Um, so if the city doesn't do it, but I, and, and it's even it's even worse than that, which is that whatever the deal is with the city translates mostly into our uh, TW negotiation, and they're entitled to take it to arbitration. So they they have the power to say, you know what, I just want the deal, the economic deal that was given to the DC thirty seven city workers, and that's it. And they and they usually will get that in arbitration. But what we did in this time around is we did attack some key issues. We worked with the union to make sure we were uh, we were dealing with healthcare costs, which is a huge cost for the MTA, um, and some other you know and some other important provisions. We are in the process of finalizing a a uh, some you know, rules about which physicians can be used for workman's compensation diagnostics. So hopefully people get better. Better coverage, better, uh, better health care from the get go, and aren't necessarily immediately entering into that side of, of, of our world where workman's comp becomes, you know, a source of litigation for law firms and, and, and doctors who specialize in that. So we're working. We, we did what we could, but we are in the uh, commuter railroad environment, continuing to talk to our unions about productivity. And work rule uh, concessions that that uh, that are outdated. You know, the, the railroads were, were unionized very early compared to the rest of the American industry. It's like the second half of the 19th century. So they have some really antiquated work rules and trade differences. Well, who can do what? And getting rid of that has value both for for their workforce and also for us in terms of productivity. We're going to continue. And finally, on um, Penn Station, you referenced the 75% of the station that hasn't been touched since the 1960s. Um, the firm ASTM from Italy proposed a novel contract structure for the MTA, at least. It's certainly been used in Europe and Asia and at the Port Authority, where you would have a private entity not only design and build the new station, but also operate and maintain it. They claim this would save money over the three decades or so of operation and maintenance compared to the railroads running Penn Station. Would the MTA consider structuring its contract bid on Penn Station to take bids for design, build, operate, maintain, and compare and see would this, in fact, save money compared to having the railroads, uh, Amtrak owning Penn Station and the railroads running Penn Station? So I, I think that all contract structures are possible. Um, we're just in the process of designing what we want, and then folks can bid and say, hey, if you let me operate it or do it this way, we could save you money. The big difference between us and ASTM is not contract structure. We have P3s public partnership now to build some of those ADA stations. We've initiated this in, in, in my era um, as an option. We have design build, we have progressive design build. We're, we're doing traditional low bid contracting, but adding scheduling. How quickly can you do the job as a strategy? And we're very much open to P3s and the D-bomb version that you're talking about. The real issue is that um, is that ASTM is insisting on a vision of a new Penn Station that involves building a new massive train hall on 8th Avenue. Our passengers are wildly disproportionately coming from the center of Midtown and entering on the 7th Avenue side of the station. So uh, and an 8th Avenue customer who wants to go to the Long Island Railroad or to Amtrak has Moynihan Station, which the state of New York just built for Amtrak um, at great cost. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I just got finished telling you how much the MTA needs to invest in its existing infrastructure and how the Park Avenue is, the train shed under Park Avenue is fall, concrete is falling and we have to fix what we have. So I'm not all that enthusiastic about doing another Calatrava project where you know, there's this huge grand train hall that doesn't necessarily have any incremental transportation benefit on the 8th Avenue side. I do want to improve the station dramatically on the 7th Avenue end. 
Um, and we started to do that, as I talked about. Um, but that's the major difference between us and ASTM. It's not really the kind of So it's a disagreement about design and scope, not a disagreement about long-term management or uh, build and hand it back to Amtrak. Well, they can make a bid and they can try to prove. Well, so far, all of the costing that this Italian outfit, which is headed by my predecessor, um, uh, has done has been basically representations about how they could do things cheaper if when they bid it and they actually have to put the, their uh, their money on the table uh, and risk on the table we'll see whether they are willing to bid lower cost um, and to the public benefit that you know that's a competition I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have but what I don't want to do is pay on top of you know building a brand new train hall we have to buy on their vision we have to buy the Hulu theater from Dolan from Madison Square Garden to create a massive new train hall, which uh, is another billion dollars right there. So I'm not down for that kind of investment that takes money away from signals and ADA stations and state of good repair. That's my concern. Thank you, Chairman. And we have time for some questions. If you have a question, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, Peter, you get the first question. Uh, thank you. Um, what rules not only affect calculating uh, your... I just introduce yourself with your, with your full name and your name. Um, that's Peter Cohen, I'm with the Transportation Research Forum. Um, what rules also affect the capital side? Yeah. In Phil Plotch's book about the Second Avenue subway, he pointed out that a tunneling machine that was used in Barcelona was operated by seven employees. The same tunneling machine here had to use 25 employees. I'm just wondering what the MTA can do to influence this situation so that we don't have this kind of waste. Well, yeah, I don't know that, I, I've heard that that uh, as well. Um, what we have to do is to, is to negotiate with, you know, we're not the ones, oddly, we're not the ones who hire the, the, the workforce, it's the contractors. But you're not wrong that because ultimately it co costs the public money, we have to be at the table when work rules that have disproportionate costs for the public are are uh, are being negotiated. So I push for that. Um, I, don't, I don't claim that I've solved the whole problem, but what we've said to <coughs> the heavy civil construction industry is when you're in labor negotiations, we want to hear about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Any more questions? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm Liam, I'm involved in transportation. I think you part of the problem, I actually rode my bike here. Um, I had a question. When you had slides and you were talking about New York State's sort of going budget, yeah. I don't know if it was meant to be like when you projected it, the negative bars got bigger and bigger. Are those actual projections or is that just sort of, I mean, I guess my question is, is the hole getting bigger at this New York State? have to just keep filling it? Like, how does it look going forward? So um, five years of balanced budgets, we had, um, because of the reduction in ridership and revenue, our, our um, the, the, the deficit was slated to be 2.6 billion in 24, rising to 3 billion four years out. So um, uh, the, the deal that we put together, which includes MTA efficiencies as well as um, more payroll mobility tax from uh, the large New York business, mm -hmm. large New York businesses, covered that deficit. And at the end of it, um, we were given as part of this solution a slice of the um, projected casino revenues just from the casinos that are being developed. Or, and permitted in New York City, which hadn't previously been planned. So they hadn't had their revenues. So uh, that's how uh, we got to balance budget. But, you know, I don't, I don't, we're not planning to bust the budget anytime soon. That actually works. That plan actually works on paper. It all, it all depends on like every budget is based on a projection, but you have to hit your numbers. And so far we're on track. Chairman, I'll give you the last word on recovery, your favorite topic of optimism. So we're at about three quarters of pre-COVID yeah. ridership on subways and commuter rail. 
what does the MTA and the city and people have to do to get back to 2019 levels of ridership? And do you think we can get there? Uh, listen, I'm, I, I don't know if we're going to get there anytime soon. And honestly, I mean, our projections are we're, you know, for the, the near future, we would get into the 80%. I think we're almost... We're getting there right now because considering, and just being honest, the increase in fare evasion, even on subways, is probably seven points higher. So apples to apples with 2019, ridership is seven points higher than paid ridership in before. So we're probably at 80%. Same on bus, unfortunately, is massive fare evasion that's still in that. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's a, a ridership problem. Uh, we have room to bring people back. Um, which is one of the points that we made in the congestion pricing discussion. We have the room, we are growing service, especially on the railroad. Um, but we are, we're, I think we're in decent shape to continue to grow and to support New York's economy. I don't feel though that the success or failure of the MTA depends on whether the Lexington Avenue line um, forces you in the, at eight o'clock in the morning, forces you to get to know the body of <laughs> 30 other New Yorkers, right? It was, it was, it was too, it was overcrowded in some respects. So we have to grow capacity um, and continue to track riders back. And that and the things that you always talk about, which is the frequency and reliability of service, the sense of safety, um, are really the key ingredients to that. Well, thank you again, Chairman. And we look forward to hopefully inviting you back next year when anybody who drives here next December, and I know nobody would dream of driving here, will have this is the ultimate. This is the ultimate mass transit location. Anyone who drives here is nuts, right? <laughs> Got the Long Island Railroad, Metro, Red, Great Subway Service, buses galore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>